a, a little bit of an overview about the deletion and then about the health care guidelines, uh, which were developed as a collaborative with many uh, people working in the field over a very long period of time, beginning back in 2006. And for the families, we brought copies of the, the guidelines that we're going to talk about, and they'll be at the desk so everyone can take, take a copy home. So just a little history, because I think it's important for everybody to know where we've come, come from. Um, so in 1965, Dr. Angelo DeGeorge, seen here with the patient, uh, described children with uh, what was called neonatal hypoparathyroidism, so they had low calcium, immune problems, so fighting infection was difficult, and then later on, congenital heart disease or differences in the heart uh, were added to this group of findings uh, that later came to bear his name. Move forward from 1965 to 1982, and this child was identified with the same features that he had originally described in 1965. And this was done at, at my hospital way before me by Dr. Lance Sakai who saw that the child had low calcium and trouble fighting infection, and also had the heart difference that was similar to the children described by Dr. DeGeorge. And many of you may know that type of heart. It's called truncus arteriosus. But in addition, the child had an opening in the palate um, and had a difference in the, in the bowel and the GI system. And Dr. Zakai said, well, maybe something is different about this child. So she sent chromosome studies, and as you all know, chromosomes are in every cell of the body, and the cell is the smallest thing we can see under the microscope, and we break the, slot, the cell open on a slide, and we, we see the chromosomes, and we count them, and we line them up. So if you look at this, um, there were only 45 chromosomes, and we should have 46, because there was chromosome 22 and chromosome 10 came together. Um, and it turned out that the father had a rearrangement of his chromosomes as well, and it caused the baby to have a tiny piece of chromosome 10 missing, which we don't talk about much, and a tiny piece of chromosome 22 missing. So we had to think about what does that mean? And then many patients came to attention, also working with Dr. DeGeorge, that had a tiny piece of some chromosome missing, not chromosome 10, but all with a piece of chromosome 22 missing. So we, we made the, uh, the leap, the conclusion, that DeGeorge syndrome, and syndrome just means collection of findings, was due to that tiny piece of chromosome 22 missing. So then we went back and we looked at children with DeGeorge, and under the microscope, looking just at the chromosomes, we found that about 25% or one in four had the piece missing when we looked under the microscope. But the puzzle remained, what about those other three quarters of patients, or 75%? So this led to the development of something you may have heard about called fish probes in the early 1990s. Um, and that stands for putting a little bit of a light um, uh, and having it circulate in the, in the cell and sticking to its match. And so if there's no light, we know that the piece is missing. So you can see in pink that there's a pink dot and a green dot, so that chromosome 22 is okay. But the other one, you see only the green dot, meaning the pink is not there, so the piece of material is not there. So once we knew uh, that there was a better test for the piece of material missing, we also noted that there was overlap in the features that the children had. So the people described with DeGeorge, as I said, had calcium problems and immune problems and heart problems, and we noted some of those same findings in children who had a different diagnosis, which you probably know called VLO, which is palate, cardio, heart, and facial, some very mild facial differences, and not something that anyone would notice from a child sitting in a waiting room, because children with this are very beautiful children, and, and again, not something that, that people would, would notice, and probably one of the reasons why we didn't figure this out for so long. And then we realized there were a group of children in Japan who had the same type of heart difference, who were described also with mild facial differences. And in those days, we didn't even have email. So we faxed Japan and said, maybe your children have the same thing as the George and Velocardiofacial syndrome. 
And so it turned out that all of those children, for the most part, with helopartiofacial syndrome and conotruncal anomaly face syndrome, when we did fish, had the piece missing. And then it became even more complicated because there were a group of children with something called OPITS, which is someone's name, a geneticist's name, G, BDB, which were the, the initials for the patients that were first described, who also had a piece of chromosome missing. And they had differences in the, the voice box known as the larynx, the trachea, the breathing tube, and the esophagus, the feeding tube. Their eyes were a little bit wide apart, and in boys, the opening uh, for the tip of the penis was underneath, not at the tip, and that's called hypospadias. And some had a cleft lip and palate, which had not been described before with velocardiofacial syndrome. The palate was opening, open, but not a lip. And you can see this child has a tiny little scar where that was fixed. And then again, a group by the, the Italians who had something called Kaler, again, the name of the doctor, cardio heart facial syndrome because the face was what we call asymmetric crying faces. So the difference in the smile and the heart. And so um, they all had the deletion, not all of the opits because there's another form of that and it's a little complicated, but a subset have that and the Kaler cardiofacial. So what, what did this mean? It sort of demonstrated that they were all the same but they were just described differently by different people who had different expertise. So Dr. DeGeorge described the children that had the endocrine problem, the calcium. Dr. Takao in Japan, the, the heart problem, conotruncal anomaly face. And Dr. Sprintzen, a speech pathologist, velocardiofacial because he was concentrating on the palate. So since then, we've called it 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which is a lot to say especially when you're giving a talk and only have 15 minutes. Um, because it's the one thing everybody has. Everybody doesn't have calcium, everybody doesn't have heart, everybody doesn't have palate. But if you have the deletion, you're the same in that one aspect as everybody else. So now, if we come to 2014, there are new tests in the lab that are even better. And you may have heard some of these terms, MLPA, um, or microarray, and the nice thing about those is they can tell us how big is the deletion. Um, and right now, it doesn't seem to help us, but down the road, it, it may. Um, and it, will, it also helps for those children who have a smaller deletion that we wouldn't have seen with the FISH test. Um, the other thing is that the doctor doesn't have to know about this very well in order to send the test. They could be a neurologist or a developmental pediatrician, <laughs> And I know the child has some delays, I know the child has some differences, I'll send this test not thinking about 22Q, so we're more likely to find more children with this because of the better tests. Now because that piece is missing, there are about 40 genes missing. And you know, genes set up the blueprint for the body. How tall you're going to be, our hair color, our eye color. Um, and when there are pieces of, of, of chromosome material missing and genes missing, it also can change the blueprint for the body. But we also have all those other genes on all the other chromosomes, so that's why all the children are not exactly the same, because they also have inherited those other genes which can change things. Um, the other thing is that unlike the original report from Dr. DeGeorge, which was calcium, infection, and heart, when we look at the children with the deletion, the more common features are infection, heart, and palate. The calcium is common, and you're gonna hear from the, the endocrinologist about those things, but not quite as common as these things. So how common is it? Well, we have a little bit of a bias, because we sit in a children's hospital that sees a lot of children with heart defects, and you'll hear from our plastic surgeon palate differences. So we don't really know the answer of how common these are, but when we look at them, the infection problem, the heart problem, the palate problem, we see in three out of four children. When Dr. Bassett talks to you from Toronto, she sees adults and she's going to tell you that only about 40% of the children, of the adults she sees have heart disease. But that makes sense because many, many, many years ago, we weren't as good at fixing the heart as we are now, and maybe those children didn't make it to adulthood. Um, and again, the, the difference with the calcium and the children, about half of them have it in our group, 
and in ants group uh, a little bit higher in the adults. Um, and then we found things that we didn't know about, so differences in the kidney in about a third, and a lot of feeding problems and swallowing problems in about a third. And in our families, that can be the most difficult problem because a parent, especially a mother, feels like they should be able to feed their baby. And when they can, it's very difficult, and, and there's a lot of struggle with that. Um, and then you're going to hear about thyroid differences uh, from the endocrine person. So what else do we know about it? Well, we know that it's really common. Even though all those years went by that nobody knew about this and, and we didn't have a good test, now we know it's almost as common as Down syndrome. Um, and it may even be more common than this because there is such variability and, and we'll know better with new tests. And uh, in the United States and Canada and England and other places, we're looking at newborn screening, a way to test in the very first beginnings when the baby are here to say, we're going to identify children to make sure that they don't get into trouble with low calcium or that they might not have a heart problem that we couldn't hear when we listen and then they get into problems. So once we have some of those tests, we'll, we'll know better how common this is. Um, and you're going to hear again about the palate. Um, it's, it's a very common cause of palatal differences. But in the old days, we thought it was the, the common, that it was an opening in the palate, what we call overt, or you can see it, cleft palate. But in our group, only about 10% have an opening, but they have trouble with hypernasality, and you're going to hear about that with the way the palate works. And then it's, it's a common cause of developmental, excuse me, developmental disabilities, developmental delay. In fact, it's the second most common cause of these delays after Down syndrome. <clears throat> and it's also the second most common cause of congenital heart disease after Down syndrome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and these are probably, again, uh, heart differences that you've heard about. So one of the, the heart doctors at our hospital just looked at children with heart disease to see how common 22 deletion was. And in those children who had a type of difference called interrupted aortic arch type B, half of them had the deletion. And truncus arteriosus, again, something you've heard, about a third. And then tetralogy of below, about 15%. But if you add a difference in the, in the pulmonary artery, it's a little higher. And this said to cardiologists, if you see a baby with any of these findings, you should look for 22Q. It's important that you look, and that's a message that we tried to get to the cardiologist. But when you look at the children with the deletion, so not the general group with heart, but children who have the deletion, the most common finding is tetralogy of below or ventricular septal defect, just a tiny hole, which is very common, and then the other things that are, are complicated. But we also found, if you look at these images, something called a vascular ring in a subset of children, where the vessels that come off of the heart wrap around the esophagus and the trachea and squeeze. And you see the little indentation. And that causes trouble with feeding, and it causes trouble with breathing, but it's something that's fixable. And I think the most important message here today, and I think Dr. Bassett will say the same, is that all of the things that we're talking about are treatable. We just have to know about them in order to treat them. And I mentioned um, the other things that are common and important. So the kidneys, it's important that we look at the kidneys. It's important that we pay attention to the feeding and swallowing because many of those things we can help. And I know that parents sometimes hear about, you know, a list of 180 findings. But I'm not sure that that list is useful because if you have dark circles under your eyes called allergic shiners, is that something we need to treat? Is that something we need to know about? Certainly if somebody has allergies, we want to help them. But these are the things that are important. The heart, the palate, the infections, the kidneys, the feeding. And then there are lots of other things that can be associated that are important, but they're rare. So as I mentioned, problems with the esophagus and the trachea, hearing loss in some children, sometimes just because of lots of, of ear infections, and sometimes that's related to the way the palate works, um, sinus infection. So again, a combination of the immune problem, that's not fighting infection, and the anatomy of, of the palate and, and whatnot. <clears throat> Occasionally, we see things that matter 
that are, again are rare, like an opening in the diaphragm. So you can see here in this child that the contents of the bowel were in the chest and it's certainly fixable, but uh, this child was a little bit older and had symptoms that they weren't quite sure what was going on, but we, we listened to the parent because the parent called and said, he's not right, he's not right, come in, we'll see you, we'll figure it out. And then things, again, that don't necessarily mean, mean a big problem, like extra fingers or extra toes, but they can help us think about making the diagnosis. And yesterday we heard a talk about the spine because about 20% of children develop scoliosis, a curvature of the spine, and sometimes it's not something that you can see easily, so we have to continue to follow the spine as children get older. Um, and then again, there's, there's a list. Some children have seizures that don't have to do with, with calcium. Some children have autoimmune disease, so arthritis and things like that, um, and something we, we have to help. Um, and something that probably is related to the immune system. And you're going to hear a lot about school and, and intellectual deficits, and they're common, but they're variable. Um, and sometimes things like a full-scale IQ, the IQ score doesn't accurately describe the function of the child. And I know Dr. Moss is gonna talk about it, but for example, this is a child who had a high verbal score and a low performance score. So verbal reading and uh, whatnot and performance math. So the full scale IQ was 87, but the child wasn't functioning like, like having that kind of IQ. Um, the other thing that's important is that the presence and severity of problems varies by age. Um, and so for instance, this is, a, this is made by Dr. Alex Abel in England. You know, in the beginning, people are worried about the heart and the feeding and then you get over some of those medical things and you start to concentrate more on, on the learning. Um, and again, the, the indications for testing varies by age. So if you have a heart defect as a child, you're going to pay attention. But if you don't have that, you'll, you'll hear from others. You may not come to attention until you're in school and having trouble. Am I all right? Okay. And then in the absence of features, the diagnosis can be missed. And as you can see in these children, again, you wouldn't pick them out of a waiting room that they should have a problem. Um, and so we need to pay attention to, to all kinds of findings. And we, we see a lot of variability, even between identical twins. So we're, we're trying to figure out why that is. Why does one child have a heart difference and one not? Um, and, and there's no particular group that has this. All sexes, both sexes, all races, and ethnic groups are affected, and it's important to know that mortality, the rate of death, is low. If you read the old literature under George syndrome, there was a high rate of death, but in our large group of patients that we follow, only 4% succumbed to associated problems, mostly congenital heart disease, and if a child was going to die, usually it was quite young, about four months. And I don't know if there's anybody in the room who has a child with a duplication, um, but this is the opposite of a deletion, but the findings are very similar and something we're learning more about. So uh, just a couple of uh, sentences about inheritance. So most of the time it just happens and it has to do with the way the chromosomes line up, but once it's there, the chance of passing it on is 50-50 every time. And many times the parent who has the deletion as an adult didn't realize they had the deletion and so we diagnose the parent and the child at the same time. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to slip through these slides and just talk about the guidelines. So all of this variability that we talked about poses a lot of challenges for healthcare providers. How do we approach the management for individuals and how do we approach management as a whole and so to answer these questions, we came up with the paper that I have for you in the other room um, to say to pediatricians and to family doctors, what should you do practically? So it talks a lot about the endocrine and managing the calcium and, and following the calcium. It talks about early intervention for school and for speech and treating illness that's treatable like ADHD or anxiety or depression. 
And we put in lots of tables because it's, there's a lot of information to put in and it highlights, you know, that we have to look at the whole child routinely. But at the same time, your child is a child and you need to have everyday life and go to the playground and do those kinds of things. So maybe you give the guidelines to the pediatrician and the pediatrician worries about the list and you can just worry about being a parent. Um, and then we talk about pregnancy in, in adults as being a, a stressor. So if an, an adult has the deletion and they're a woman and they, they have a pregnancy, we need to worry about things like the heart disease if it's been repaired or calcium, things like that. Um, and we couldn't put everything in, so this is a work in progress. And you'll see that some of us are wearing a little pin because we formed a society to work on, on more things together. Um, and things about uh, paying attention to calcium during surgery, after surgery. And we also formed a group to pay attention to the brain, to understand how the brain works and how to, how to sort through what genes are important. And this is a very big group, 22 sites across four continents. Um, so I'm just going to say that in conclusion, the 22Q11.2 deletion is an important condition which needs awareness raised in pediatrics, adult care, prenatal diagnosis, and hopefully soon a newborn screening. And we need to work together to bring such awareness. Um, I know that many of you, if you were in Madrid or, or Barcelona, you participated in partnerships, um, such as 22Q at the Zoo, Worldwide Awareness Day. And I think together we can, we can raise awareness and we can help uh, bring support to families and to doctors who, who need to know about this and need to help you uh, care for this. So I just want to acknowledge all my colleagues at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and uh, many thanks to you and all of our patients because it always begins with you and I'll stop and answer questions.